Okay, damn it, calm down, the voice of my childhood friend, Dave Peterson, rasped in my ears. Dave stood over me, looking at me as I tried to explain my role in the incident. Dave was now the county sheriff in our small town in Ohio. There were very bright lamps above my head. It was like one of those old TV shows where they try to extract a confession from a sinister criminal. It was so corny and so funny that I kept laughing even though it was serious. I looked around the room to see if anyone else found it funny. The plump figure of Martha Erickson, the district attorney, seemed unfunny as she listened to my testimony. Martha was constantly tapping her pen against a stack of two or three legal pads. The only thing that came to my mind when she continued to tap with that damn pen was, God, woman, it's the 21st century, get yourself a damn iPad. Martha is ten years or so older than me. She is divorced and overweight, but nice. As she leans forward, all her beautiful brown hair falls forward and flows over her shoulders. Her forward bend also gives me a view of her sweater melons, which are quite sizable and exceptionally beautiful. I know what you're thinking, and the answer is no. It's not that I don't find Martha sexy as hell, but I'm a one-woman man. This as yet unnamed woman is also the reason this man is in this position. Next to Martha was Joe Colston. Joe is my lawyer. For a small-town lawyer, he's not bad. Of course, he could have worked for one of the big auto companies in Detroit before. He could still be there if he wanted, but Joe is lazy as hell. He only wants to work on one thing at a time and only when he feels like it. He spends the rest of his time lying on his ass, giving legal advice for a fee via the internet. Joe is in his fifties with a balding head. His hair is completely gone from the front. He has one of those Donald Trump comb-overs that polite people smile about but never mention. Joe could have been a lot more impressive. You his is one of those Donald Trump hairstyles that polite people smile about but never mention. Joe could be much more impressive and probably more attractive to women if I just gave up on my hair. Damn, these are people of the 21st century. Joe, you have three options, buddy. They all assume that you admit that you are bald. First, just accept it and comb your hair normally. Trim and style it. Everyone has seen men lose their hair. It's part of life. Secondly, get a hair transplant or plugs. If they work for Elton John, they will work for anyone. And the last option, just shave that shit off and look like Professor X. It certainly didn't hurt that Florida prosecutor, the one they call Angel of Death. As soon as he shaved his head, this guy was all over women and even got a cool-sounding nickname. You can just hear the trumpets in the background when someone says this name. Try it. Say, Angel of Death. You know, you heard that, yes, yes, trumpet fanfare. I'm sure this guy is a much more impressive lawyer than my boyfriend. Let's face it, if you were opposing counsel, who would you be more worried about facing in court? Angel of Death or combed Joe. In any case, let's return to the scene. Sitting next to Joe, separated from me by Dave, is the woman in my only female to male status, Allison Payne. Okay, the title is largely my fault. Her maiden name was Allison Scott, but then I married her and made her name the butt of hundreds of jokes. Allison is very beautiful. She is petite but curvy. Everything about her is perfect. Her hair is silky and straight and red as a fucking fire engine with ketchup splattered all over it. Her skin is not like that Irish skin that looks like milk and never tans. Her color is healthy and perfect. Her green eyes draw you in and her smile just grabs you and makes you want to listen to her. I loved her from the first second I saw her. I know some guys who get so caught up in her conversations when they first meet that they never hear her say all the wonderful things that come out of her mouth. Something like, Get away from me, you idiot. I have a boyfriend. Guess what? I'm that guy. Oh damn, I was wrong again. I'm not her boyfriend anymore. We got married. Anyway, to continue setting the scene for you, Allison is petite. So if you're expecting me to say that she has huge breasts, and that's what gives me the strength to keep my eyes off Martha. You're wrong. Allison's breasts are probably the size of cupcakes, but very perky. 
they are perfect for her. Her ass, although small, is curved and again perfect for her. Allison is smiling now, and she directs that smile with amazing precision. That smile bounces off the wall next to her and circles around Joe to reach me. I smile back at her. It's so wonderful to be in love. Nothing else matters when you feel this good. Everything else fades into the background and becomes a trifle. Even the charges of assault with a deadly weapon, attempted murder, and intent to cause great bodily harm that are currently hanging over my head pale in comparison to the fact that Allison is now smiling at me, and she loves me. These accusations are something else that we now share. Allison also faces charges of kidnapping and false imprisonment. Here's my girl. In contrast, Tammy Jo Dickschlucker just glares at us. Her anger, hatred, and obvious jealousy towards Allison almost sucks all the fun out of the room. Tammy Jo's parents, as you can imagine, have a stunning lack of imagination, but they are good people and are not at all responsible for how she turned out. Her mother's name is Tammy, and her father's name is... Steve. But he always promised to name his firstborn after the guy who saved his life when he was in the service. Tammy Jo loves to be called TJ, and her two friends try to remember that. Most people call Tammy Jo a pleasure. No, that's not a pun on her last name. That's basically what she is. I have my own affectionate nickname for Tammy Jo. I call her Skankzilla. That's what I call her when I address her at all. I guess I should have mentioned Skankzilla. I mean, Tammy Jo, my ex-wife. Either way, Tammy Jo and Allison are nothing alike. Tammy Jo is a little taller, a lot curvier, and not nearly as cute. Okay, since I'm trying to be honest, TJ is fat now. But it wasn't always like this. She was always damn hot. But time, gravity, and depression have left their mark on her. It seems that in my youth, I was a creature of excess. I believe that if I liked something, I should have the biggest and best of it. I really admire women with beautiful legs. Tammy Jo has the thickest, most curvilinear legs you can find. I really love a big butt. Tammy Jo's ass would be right at home with one of the rap star's girlfriends. I love breasts, and Tammy Jo's bra size is 46 quad Z, or something like that. I don't really know anything about bra sizes, but these things are huge. She has long, wavy, dark hair and icy blue eyes. Tammy Jo was my first love. We got married as soon as I received my degree, and if she hadn't been so available and a creature, we would probably still be together. Okay, Dave shouted again. Are you or aren't you responsible for cutting off the victims? Uh, equipment? I calmly looked at Dave and said, I don't. Well, maybe we do but it's not my fault. Well, now we've come to something, Dave said. It's her fault. She did it. Well, that's not entirely true either, I said. Look at her, Dave. She is the most beautiful thing God has ever created. This is Sheriff Peterson when we work a case, Dave said, and I don't care how beautiful your wife is. I just need to know who the hell cut the mayor's son off his thing. I have the answer, Dave. That is Sheriff Peterson, sir, I said. I was tempted to give him a little salute, but I knew if I did, I would laugh until I cried. Then Allison would start laughing too, and we would have to start all over again. It was an accident, I said. I was actually trying to save this idiot when it happened. I noticed Martha frantically writing down notes as I spoke. I looked at her notebook. Martha. Jerk is spelled with two S, I said. Then I looked back at Dave. Really, this is all her fault, I said, pointing across the room at Skankzilla, that is, Tammy Jo. Danny, how the hell can this be Deke's fault? I mean Tammy Jo. She was in Michigan, over a hundred miles away, when this all happened. Dave, the events that unfolded tonight are the culmination of a shit storm that began three years ago while I was still married to Deeks. I mean, Tammy Jo. Well, Sherman, start the time machine, Dave said. Let's listen. That guy's going to be in surgery for at least a couple more hours. 
and none of us are going anywhere until we get this thing sorted out. There's coffee and everything on the table for anyone who needs it. I saw Allison raise her hand. Dave turned to look at her. You don't have to raise your hand, Allison. This isn't school. I could tell Dave was trying to be strict. Since he was attracted to Allison, it shouldn't have seemed that way to everyone else in the room. I was just wondering if I could sit there, she said. It could be a long story and I would be more comfortable. She pointed to the chair I was sitting on. Danny's sitting there, he said. If he wants to give up his seat, I don't care. Let's just start this story. Oh, I don't want him to give me his seat, she said. Allison stood up, and even the two deputies at the door sighed as she approached me, and lifting one gracefully sculpted leg after the other, she settled on my lap. She then wrapped her arms around me and rested her head on my shoulder. The collective gulp from the men in the room was loud enough to be heard, and I was actually glad I was wearing jeans. No other material would be strong enough to contain my horniness. When Dave looked at her in confusion, Allison smiled at him. I thought that in case we have to be in jail for a while, we'd better enjoy all the alone time we can get. Dave nodded, and I swear his eyes didn't blink at that moment. Hell no, Tammy Joe exclaimed. I don't want that little bitch sitting on my husband's lap. Ex-husband, I answered sharply. You would still be my husband if that sneaky little bitch hadn't stolen you away from me during a minor crisis in our relationship, Tammy Joe hissed. You mean our divorce? I exclaimed back to her. Tammy Joe knows how to kill the mood of everyone around her. Does anyone have any objection to Mrs. Payne babysitting her husband? Dave asked. No, let's just listen to the story, Martha said. Actually, I think it's quite cute. What makes my client happy makes me happy, Joe said. I'm not sure, but I thought I caught Joe looking at Martha's feet. Okay, I started. It all started three years ago. I was making really good money and living a full life. Me and a couple of the guys I went to school with all graduated from the University of Michigan with engineering degrees. I majored in manufacturing in the automotive industry. My partners, George and Marty, were engineers too. George is an electrical engineer and Marty is a mechanical engineer. It was not the 80s and work was difficult to find, but we bypassed this trend, went against the system. Instead of looking for a job with the big three or another car company, we started our own business before the ink was dry on our degrees. We started our own consulting firm and soon had a lot of clients wanting to hire us. I was still with my first love, Tammy Joe and there was no question of if we would get married. It was only a question of when. Tammy Jo had always been quite wild throughout college. She was her daddy's little girl and planned to remain a virgin until marriage. We went to different colleges after high school, where I respected her decision to stay pure until marriage. Some guys at her school don't. Looks like Tammy Jo was taken advantage of by some guys at her school who didn't do it. Tammy Jo was apparently assaulted at her 20th birthday party. One of the guys she dated a few times decided that her cherry was rotten and needed to be removed before it infected the rest of her body. He and some of his sorority buddies got her so drunk that she couldn't walk and then initiated her into the joys of sex. When she woke up the next morning, she knew something had changed, but she couldn't understand why she was so sore there. She kept running into the guys that were there, and they all tried to blackmail her into keeping quiet about the fact that she had taken over almost their entire fraternity. Almost all of them made the same offer. They would remain silent if she gave them pleasure from time to time. So she did. At first it was, as I said, just to keep them quiet, but after a while she obviously started to like it. After a while, it was no longer possible to hide what she was doing, but Tammy Jo noticed that none of the men involved had ever dated her. No one wanted to appear in public with her. Because of her reputation, none of the guys would have her either. They all assumed she had sex with everything that wasn't nailed down. Neither of them wanted to risk contracting whatever disease-causing cocktail was brewing in her nether regions. Tammy Jo took stock of her summer life when she returned home. 
she was the laughing stock of the entire campus. Nobody wanted to meet her. Nobody spoke to her. She not only had no male friends, but also no female friends. Even her roommate moved out to avoid contact with her. She was the university bike, but no one else wanted to ride her. The funny thing was that, with the exception of that first time when the guys took her cherry, Tammy Jo had never really had real sex, and she was so drunk that she barely remembered anything. So when I got back together with Tammy Jo that summer and we started hanging out, she saw a chance to change her star. Tammy Jo has always been a very stylish girl. Even to this day, she's a bitch, but a great bitch. In fact, I'd probably be right when I say that Tammy Jo could be the most stylish woman in any bowling alley or trailer park wherever she chooses to hang out. That summer, Tammy Jo and I reconnected and fell in love. I fell in love with both Tammy Jo's curvaceous body and the personality that resided within it. I truly believed that she loved me and would do anything for me. What was really interesting was that throughout our entire courtship and early months of our marriage, she was never a bitch to me. In our first year together, we tried and experienced everything sexual that is humanly possible. If only I knew. It started innocently enough, a drama that ruined our lives together. Tammy Jo and I were walking along the beach near our house when we saw her. Her name was Laura, as I learned a few days later, and she was the perfect complement to Tammy Jo. Where Tammy Jo was curvy and fat, Laura was tall and slender. She played tennis on the court next to the beach, and the legs under her tennis dress attracted the attention of every man in the area. She's really damn hot, isn't she? Tammy Jo asked. I was a little surprised by the question. Not as hot as you, honey, I said. Her legs are good, but they are a little thin. Oh, you'll have me tonight, she said enthusiastically. After a few moments, she returned to the topic again. As an engineer, I really should have paid more attention. If you had a chance, I wouldn't mind. Would you sleep with her? Tammy Jo asked. Be honest. Maybe, I said, looking at her cautiously. It's your birthday soon, she said. I think I know what to give you. I didn't really worry about my birthday. For the first time, I allowed myself luxury. We had Ford among our clients. I got a good discount and bought myself the car of my dreams. Yes, I'm sure you all know what I bought. Instead of one of those foreign sports cars, I bought a Ford GT. The GT was produced for only a few years as a tribute to one of Ford's finest racing cars of yesteryear. It was and remains the fastest production car ever produced by Ford. It was Ford's version of a supercar. It rivals Lamborghini and Ferrari and was the most expensive thing I've ever bought outside of our house. I spent most of the day riding it around the area and getting used to it. I was about to take it out onto the highway and let it go when my cell phone rang. Danny, come home and open your present, Tammy Joe said. I entered the house a short time later and looked around for Tammy Jo. She was nowhere to be found. I'm here in the bedroom, she called from above. I ran up the stairs as quickly as possible, jumping two or three steps at a time. I was out of breath when I got to our room. As I walked into the room, I saw Tammy Jo bent over with one leg on our bed. Her huge breasts hung over the edge of the bed. On our bed, among all those stupid pillows that only women understand their purpose, lay the two things I loved most, spread out, waiting for me. Tammy Joe's ass and breasts have always driven me crazy. By this point, all the rich nutrition and food had made her a little plumper, but she was still sexy as hell. I dropped my pants so quickly you would have thought they were the ones strippers wear. Wait, cowboy, Tammy Joe said, turning to face me. She stood up and my saliva began to flow, even after all this time when those sweater melons fell almost to her waist. What are we waiting for, I thought. I think it was a challenge, she said, smiling. I still wanted to see if you wanted it. She lifted her heavy breasts as she smiled at me. I quickly nodded my head up and down. It's good to know that I'm still valued and I haven't turned into some useless fat-assed housewife that doesn't turn you on anymore, she said. 
That will never happen. TJ, I said. Remember, this was back when I still thought I loved the bitch. So she was TJ to me back then. Well, whatever, she said. She must have been watching PBS or BBC again. You won't take advantage of me tonight, she said with a smile. At least not right away. In honor of your birthday, she said, I got this ready for you. The door to our bathroom opened and Laura came out wearing only a ribbon and high heels. The ribbon wrapped around her small breasts, wrapped around her back, and hugged her small waist. You can turn me around whenever you want, she said. Okay, the first thing you need to know is that I have always been a one-woman man. But damn, it was my birthday, and there was something about Laura. She had qualities that Tammy Jo didn't have. She was truly beautiful. She was also very nice. Tammy Jo had one hell of a body, and I loved her. But she was a girl with a nice body, but an ugly face. Tammy Jo wasn't very nice either. She's always been quite a bitch, just not my type. And having money only made the situation worse. If I told Tammy Jo I didn't want her gift, she would be furious. I'm not a coward, but I didn't want this bitch I knew was simmering just below the surface. I'll be back in a couple of hours, Tammy Jo said. Unless you call me and ask me to stay longer. Tohen the door slammed. All sorts of alarm bells went off in my head. I looked at Laura. She looked at me and smiled. She started walking towards me slowly, and those high heels were clicking, thump, thump, all over the floor. On paper, she was much sexier than Tammy Jo. But on for some reason I wasn't excited, and I pulled my pants up. Laura's face was dejected. You didn't do anything wrong, I said. You're actually the best birthday present I've ever received. You're even better than my car. Her expression immediately changed. What car? she asked. Ford GT, I said. You're crap on me, she said. Can we go for a ride? Can I look under the hood? We spent two hours becoming friends. We took the car for a drive, and I let her look under the hood. We discussed all kinds of performance ratings and engine modifications. Laura told me that she felt very comfortable with me. She had just given me my birthday kiss when Tammy Jo pulled up in front of the house. Tammy Jo smiled from ear to ear as she watched Laura get into her little car and drive away. Did you have fun? she asked. I nodded my head and didn't lie. We really had a good time. It wasn't as bad as you thought, was it? she asked. What? I asked. I was just about to tell her that nothing happened when she confused me by starting the same nonsense she had been hinting at for weeks. For over a month, Tammy Jo had been hinting and discussing the possibility of us joining a sex group. No, I know what you're thinking. I tried several times to tell Tammy Jo that I didn't like it, but she just wouldn't take no for an answer. She beat the same horse from every possible angle. The look on my face when she brought it up told her she had screwed up, so she let the evening die. A week later, Laura returned. I asked her if she forgot anything, and she said she came for the same reason as last time. Did Tammy Jo convince you to try it again? I asked. She didn't need to convince me, Laura said. After I met you last week, I really like you, and I like the way you kiss. Where's Tammy Jo? I asked her. She said she was going shopping, Laura said. She says she loves you too much to watch you the first few times, and that her presence here might make you nervous. She says you'll get used to it with time. I just sat down and frowned. Laura came up to me and started stroking my shoulders. Her touch really felt good. Why don't you tell me about it? She said. I told her that I might be stupid and old-fashioned, but that I really loved Tammy Jo. I didn't need anyone else, either in bed or in life, except as a friend. She told me that Tammy Jo loved me just as much. It took an extraordinary woman who would go to the trouble that Tammy Jo put me through to try to make me happy. I nodded my head in agreement, but I wanted Tammy Jo to see that she was all I needed. This is exactly how we spent the second time when Laura came. When I saw Laura for the third time, everything changed. Tammy Joe told me we were having a barbecue when I got home from work that evening. 
It would be us and two other couples. The first couple I knew from our area. They lived a couple blocks from here, and I talked to this guy a couple of times about my car. Actually, that's how we met them. When the second car arrived, I was shocked. It was Laura, and she was dragging some runaway guy with her. He was too old for her, and something was wrong about them. You already know Laura, Tammy Jo said. She was wearing a bikini top that just couldn't contain the girls. This is Laura's boyfriend, Ken. The guy held out his hand for me to shake, and I looked at him. Something was wrong with him. At first his smile seemed more like a smirk than a smile. It was like he knew something that I didn't know, and it was damn funny. I immediately disliked him. I just pretended I didn't see him reach out his hand. Secondly, his reaction to Tammy Joe was unsatisfactory. The neighbor, Bob, couldn't take his eyes off TJ's chest, like most guys. Tammy Joe should never have worn that damn top in front of people, and I told her so later that evening. But Ken didn't react at all. So, either he was gay, or he had seen my wife's breasts enough times that they no longer affected him. Tammy Joe's hooters were still affecting me, and I was married to her. After we ate, the neighbor couple thanked us and had to leave. They had a small child, and their nanny could only stay there for a short time. While we were relaxing by the pool, Ken struck up a conversation. Damn, that's some kind of machine, he said. Laura never stops talking about it. Laura looked at her feet. I thought maybe she was showing off my car, and that caused bad feelings between them. It's just a car, I said. I didn't believe it for a second, but I tried to lighten the mood. She really wants to ride it, he smiled. My spidey sense was tingling because, damn, she was already in the car. She even drove him. I reached into my pocket, took out the keys, and threw them to him. Be careful, I said. The clutch is tight and the power comes on quickly. He threw me the keys. Could you take it? He asked. She really wants it, and I want her to have the experience and enjoy it. But I can't drive a stick. Come on, Danny, Tammy Joe said. You like to show that kind of care and talk about it. So blind, stupid, naive old Danny took Laura for a walk, hoping someone would explain what the hell was happening to me. Laura, who was also wearing a swimsuit, told me that she would go and put something on top of it. When she stood up, I saw it, although I had never noticed it. Laura was excited. Laura was beautiful. But Tammy Jo was just sexy. Laura was the kind of woman you could wear an evening dress or a little black dress with and go to a gala or party. Any man there would envy you if you walked in with her on your arm. But Tammy Jo was the kind of woman that as soon as you saw her, you immediately wanted her. You should have taken it. It was something written into the DNA code of every man and even some women. Looking at her, I smiled and said that I love her. I was so glad she was mine. To hell with dinner parties and galas. What the hell is a gala? And that was another strange thing that I didn't notice. When Laura said she would wear something, Ken told her to keep it as she was. What kind of guy sends his woman off with another man in a skimpy swimsuit? I looked at Tammy Jo. I'm going to go get changed right now, Tammy Jo said. Laura and I went out and drove around. We got on the freeway and tried to get the car up to a top speed of 200 mph. About half an hour later, much earlier than anyone expected, we headed back. Laura sat by the pool and I walked into the house and saw them. Who had sex with my wife? I crossed the hall before they even knew I was coming. I tried my best to break Ken's leg in the ass. Then I threw him to the floor and started beating him over and over again until Tammy Jo grabbed me and pulled me away from her. Danny, what are you doing? She exclaimed. You're going to kill him. You're a damn natural, approachable girl, I spat at her. Get out of my house and take this piece of shit with you. On the floor, Ken was moaning for another reason. Despite everything I had done to him, he was still relatively unharmed. Laura came in and looked at him. What happened to him? She asked. I misread Laura's expression again. When I saw the lack of concern about her boyfriend kicking ass, 
I thought maybe he was hitting her, and she felt like he deserved what he got. I was wrong. Take him home, Tammy Joe said. He'll be fine. He has a black eye and some cuts, but it was all just a big misunderstanding. I just stood there and watched as Laura led Ken out the front door. None of them said anything. Why are you still in my house? I asked. Tammy Joe, I told you to hit the bricks and I meant it. Tammy Joe just gave me that deer caught in the headlights look. I expected a lot of reaction from her. She would probably be sarcastic, insult me, and say that if I weren't so miserable in bed, she wouldn't have to look for him. Maybe she'll try the classic line, this isn't what you think of as a routine, and try to lie her way out of it. Or the hard line, fuck you, this is my house too, a gambit. In the end, it wasn't the same. Her face distorted, became unhappy, and simply burst into tears. She looked so hurt, so broken. It was as if her whole world had just collapsed. The funny thing is that she looked and acted as if she had done nothing wrong. She looked as if the mistake was on my part. It was as if we had some long-standing rule or code of conduct, and I had just broken it. Damn it, I still loved that stupid woman. So her breakdown affected me on a very deep level. And yes, I walked up to her and hugged her and told her everything would be okay. I swore to her that I would be very generous in the divorce, even though we had a prenuptial agreement that my lawyer insisted on. All he did was start another round of screaming and crying even louder. She pushed me away from her and ran to the table. She took out a pen and wrote it down in her childish handwriting. I do not want or accept any money from Danny or his damn company. She signed it with her signature scrawl and handed it to me, crying even louder. I knew, and I'm sure she knew, that it wouldn't hold up in court. But it made me curious. If it wasn't about money, what the hell was it about? Then what do you want, TJ? I asked her. You can get a house too. Look, I'll give you more money than what's in the prenuptial agreement, even though we both signed it. Surprisingly, this didn't help. She just started crying louder. Maybe we're just not the people we thought we were, I said. This way, you will be free to go out and do whatever you want, and you won't have to worry about me finding out about it. She cried even louder. I was stumped. What do you want, TJ? I asked again. I just want you, she screamed. This is all I ever wanted. That's all I'll ever want. This is nothing like the way you had sex a few minutes ago, I snapped. Maybe you and him could just settle down somewhere and be truly happy together. She looked at me as if I was really stupid. She actually wiped away her tears and tilted her head to the side and looked at me like dogs do when their owner does something really stupid. I turned around and looked around to see if anyone else was in the room. She just shook her head. You really don't understand any of this, do you? She said. I understand that I am not going to stay married to someone who cheats on me, I said. How did I cheat on you? She asked. Explain this to me. Danny. I love you with all my heart and soul. You and I will be together until the stars darken and fall from the sky. Tammy Joe, you really need to take this crap to other pastures, I snapped. Danny, love and sex are not the same thing, she told me. She said all this very calmly and very slowly. It was as if she was talking to a very stupid child. You and I are young, and we have a lot of money to spend. We're still figuring out what we like and setting the parameters for our life together. Maybe I'm a little off in my head. It can't be helped, but right now I want to experiment and try some things. Our sex life is so good that it just keeps me wanting to grow and experience different aspects of human sexuality. I was stunned. One of us had problems with his head. At that moment, I couldn't tell if it was her or me. She made it all sound so normal and so logical. What does this have to do with you cheating on me and having sex in our living room like a fucking bitch? I asked. I didn't cheat on you, she snapped even louder. Danny, I've been trying to get you to try swinging with me for over a month. This is what I really want to do. You said no and I respect that. I have to accept your decision. 
but that doesn't mean I can't try again, from a different angle. And again, she said it so calmly and so matter-of-factly that I had to accept her logic. I thought if you said no to a full-on sex party, maybe I should start on a smaller scale, she said. You know, it's like a threesome or wife swapping. Maybe then you won't mind it, and we can gradually move forward when you're more comfortable with the idea. It's either this, or I burn it all out of my system. I would definitely say no to that, too, I snapped. I don't want to swing. I don't want to swap wives. You're all I need, TJ. So if you asked me that, I'd say, hell no to that, too. But Danny, you didn't, she said. You actually really enjoyed it, a lot, even. Now all this makes me laugh. I feel fat and unattractive. I feel like I'm at risk of losing you. Tammy Joe, what are you talking about? I asked. You never said shit about wife swapping, and we didn't do a fucking threesome unless you're talking about yourself and both of Ken's faces. I can't believe this bastard. I come to my fucking house and pretend. Be my friend and then... Danny, what do you think we're doing? She asked. That's why I gave you Laura. Don't you think it's fair that if you want Laura, then Ken should have me? This is called wife exchange, not wife giving. But, I began. Words failed me and anger took over. I knew that I needed to calm down and be very careful in my actions and even what I said. I thought about telling her that I didn't have sex with Laura. This would get me in trouble because she would say that I should have told her that. The fact that I didn't tell her it was an oversight was a lie, and she profited from it, although I was just trying to spare her feelings. I also realized that Tammy Jo was manipulating this whole situation to get me to do what she wanted. Tammy Jo, I need to think about this for a while, I said. I need to make the best decision for both of us. What is there to think about, she asked. You explained your feelings, I explained mine. We obviously disagree on one small thing. We will talk about it and solve this problem. No, Tammy Joe, I said. It was a fucking scam on your part from the start. You've manipulated this whole situation, and I'm not sure it won't be a deal breaker. That's what I need to think about. Danny, this will be the only time, she said. I didn't realize you were so serious about it. You always give in to me. Don't be upset with me. Tammy Joe. I'm really upset about you. This doesn't mean you got drunk and pissed yourself in the pool. I'm trying to decide if I should try to work this out or if I should file for divorce first. She looked genuinely shocked. Danny, we're together forever, she said calmly. We're not going to get divorced. I just laughed and went upstairs to one of the guest bedrooms. I sat down in the chair next to the bed and thought seriously about the situation. Perhaps a consultation will help. Perhaps it all stemmed from what TJ told me happened to her in her first college. She may have had hidden mental issues that were affecting her. About an hour later, I heard a knock on the doorknob. Then there was a knock on the door. Danny, can we go to bed? She asked. Tammy Joe, I'm not sleeping with you, I said. Good night. Danny, it's not fair, she cried. I love you. Can't you forgive this? It's not that important. Maybe not important to you, TJ, I said. Good night. The next morning, Tammy Jo woke up before me. I heard her making noise around the house, and then she left. I thought she was in a hurry to meet Ken, and I didn't care. I think what bothered me the most was her manipulation. I got up and took a long, warm shower. One of the best things about being one of the owners of a company was that no one could tell me when I had to haul my ass to work. I got dressed and was even thinking about going to work when I heard her return to the house. She was missing for about an hour and a half. Perhaps Ken is a man for a minute, I thought. Danny, breakfast, she called. I didn't answer. When I went down to get my keys and iPad, I noticed that she had come out and bought us breakfast. Tammy Jo can't cook. She laid everything out on the table, pancakes, maple syrup, bacon, the whole thing, and made fresh coffee. Everything looked very tasty, and I was hungry, but I passed by and left the house. When I arrived at the office, 
I tried to concentrate on work. Several times I went online and searched for articles about infidelity or cheating and divorce, but I never did anything about it. When I got home that evening, Tammy Jo had dressed up. She truly looked stunning in the outfit, and this time was no exception. However, in the evening something else struck me. The charm had faded. One of the interesting phenomena in human nature is the science of perception. We tend to see only the good in the things we like. And when we're in love, it's even worse. Honestly, that night was the first time I looked closely at Tammy Jo and saw her flaws. She was always nice to me when she got her way, but I have to admit, everyone thought she was a bitch. Tammy Jo's face was never anything special, but it never mattered to me because I loved her. Looking at her that evening allowed me to see something I had missed, and finally, seeing her squeezed into a too tight dress, I realized that although I had always been attracted to her large breasts and round buttocks, her waist had noticeably increased. I was thinking we could have dinner at Texas Roadhouse tonight, she said quietly to me as I walked by. No, thanks, I said. Danny, please give me a chance to fix this, she said. I love you more than you will ever know. There is nothing more important to me than us. I'll think about it, TJ, I said. This conversation did a lot to get me thinking about forgiveness again. But over the next few days, I didn't talk to her much. Even though I could see that she was unhappy, I just wasn't ready to talk to her yet. The wound was too fresh. I was wondering how Laura felt about this. Perhaps she was upset too. I also wondered how Ken survived the beating. I wish I had thought of this sooner. I remember at the barbecue, it seemed to me that things were not going well for Laura and Ken. Perhaps that's why he was willing to let other men sleep with her. Even though Laura was beautiful, I just wasn't ready to trade her or trade her for Tammy Jo. I loved Tammy Jo so much it hurt. I just couldn't imagine life without her at that moment, so I knew what I had to do. The next morning, before I left, I walked into our bedroom and kissed Tammy Jo goodbye. She let out a little moan when I did this and tried to get me into bed with her. I missed you so much, she moaned. Then I shrugged and went to work. As soon as I arrived at the office, I called Laura. She seemed somehow depressed to me, and my feelings were on guard. I wondered if that idiot was trying to take it out on her for beating her. Laura, are you okay? I asked. Not really, she said. I could hear a hint of sadness in her voice. What's happened? I asked. Can you come over so we can talk? She asked. I said I could and asked for directions. I didn't feel comfortable going to her house, and I told her so. She gave me the address of a park near her house. I arrived at the park, and when I saw Laura, I remembered her playing tennis near the beach that day. She really was beautiful, but she belonged to that idiot. When she came closer, I saw that she was crying. What's wrong, Laura? I'm sorry for what I did to Ken. Okay, I'm not sorry, but I hope he didn't take it out on you. Why did he have to do that? She asked with a puzzled look on her face. Because he thinks you and I had sex, and he doesn't think it's right that I reacted that way when I caught him with Tammy Joe. I said. That's what upsets me the most, she whined. What you and I really don't. So you can tell him about it, and he'll leave you alone, I said. Laura just started crying. I led her to the bench. Okay, Laura, tell me what's wrong, I said. I'm an approachable girl, she cried. I spoiled it all, and that's why I don't have a chance with you, right? What are you talking about, I asked. Your wife paid me to come to your house and offer myself to you on your birthday, she said. I am a student. I have student loans, rent, tuition, and bills. I have a part-time job, but I can barely make ends meet. She offered me a thousand dollars that day. The money was too good to pass up. I liked it so much, and I really liked you. It was supposed to be a one-time thing, but she called again about a week later, and I agreed again. Honestly, I would do it for free. She stopped and wiped her tears. You didn't even make a single move on me both times. I started thinking about what you were doing and hoped that she would call me again. 
when she called for the third time and said to bring a swimsuit, I probably got my hopes up. But I noticed how much attention you paid to her and how you looked at her. I realize that I don't stand a chance because you really love her, she said. Is this what Ken was upset about? I asked. Did he find out that you might have feelings for me? She started laughing. I first met Ken on a barbecue day. Your wife asked me to pick him up and bring him with me. When I arrived at your house, it was the first time I heard of him as my boyfriend. I thought it was some kind of role play. I decided that if I got you, everything would be okay. Suddenly, I felt angry again. I thanked Laura and got into the car. I called my lawyer while driving back to work and told him that I needed to start the divorce process. My lawyer at this time, Joe Colston, was a new member of the law firm. My original lawyer moved up the ranks. He asked if I had a copy of my original prenuptial agreement. I told him I could stop by the house and fax it to him or bring it to him so he could get to work. The lump in my throat actually wasn't as bad as I expected. Maybe because I've been wondering for the past few days whether or not I should get rid of cheating Tammy Joe. I mentioned that it was all the manipulation and lies more than anything that made me angry at her. But that was just the tip of the iceberg. Okay, when it rains, it pours like buckets. And it rained on me like buckets for a week. I was so wet I never thought I'd dry out again. I didn't want to get into trouble with Tammy Joe. I just wanted it all to end. My plan was to park down the street and quietly sneak into the house, pick up the required document, and return to work. Of course, everything went wrong. As I quietly opened the gate leading to our pool and deck, I saw Tammy Joe relaxing by the pool. She was lying on her back on one of our lounge chairs in the sun, her huge breasts soaking up the sun. Unfortunately, Ken was between her legs, making full love to her while she relaxed and she was simultaneously pleasuring two other guys. I looked at the stage and suddenly I was no longer quiet. I closed the gate and they all froze in place. Oh no, Tammy Joe said. Oh shit, said Ken. He moved away from Tammy Joe, but tried to keep her between us. He quickly walked up to the fence and tried to climb over our eight foot privacy fence, but he couldn't find support. He was still barefoot and naked as a falcon and wanted to try to climb the fence and run away naked rather than face me. Apparently, that beating really made an impression on him. One of the other guys was trying to get dressed. I headed towards the door of the house. Tammy Joe began to cry. Danny, you have to let me explain. I just laughed. He's going for the gun, Ken said. Knowing my house, Ken knew that I had quite a large collection of swords battle axes, and other weapons. One of the guys tried to stop me from getting to the door. The other one rushed to the gate. Like Ken, he was still naked. The guy in front of me opened his mouth as if he was about to say something. I slapped him. What? I asked. He was still in shock from the slap. What? I asked him again. Then I hit him again and just pushed him away from me. When I left the house with the necessary document, all three men disappeared. Danny, please, Tammy Joe said. I was surprisingly calm. Say whatever you want to tell me now, Tammy Joe, I said. Then I'll go back to work. When I get home tonight, I want you and all your things gone. Less than a week ago, I offered you a good divorce. I offered you a house, money, and maybe we could still be friends someday when the pain had passed. This proposal has been withdrawn. I will stick to the prenuptial agreement. You will receive $10,000 for every year of our marriage and not a cent more. I took my checkbook out of my pocket and wrote her a check for $1.20. You can keep the car too. No, Danny, she said. I was just trying to make things better. Tammy Joe, time is ticking, I said sharply. Danny, to get everything settled and done with Ken and Laura, I needed to give him two more times. You've been with Laura three times, so to end it in a way where no one could be mad, I just had to do it, she said. Once I was done with it, I would never do anything like that again. I just laughed at her and smiled. Okay, TJ, I said. It makes sense. I understand. 
Yes, she said, smiling. Yeah, I finally realized what a lying, cheating, conniving bitch you are, I said. So I changed my mind. Keep the receipt, but call a taxi. The car stays with me. Why, she whined. Because you just lied to me at least twice, I said. I talked to Laura today. She and Ken met at the barbecue. I have a better chance of being her boyfriend than that idiot. Which means you were lying about needing to even things out with him. Who were those other two guys? Why are they here if it was about getting even with Ken? And then there's the fact that you paid Laura to be with me. Fuck you. Get out of my house and my life, you cheating bitch. But Danny, it's not cheating if we both did it. If you were with Laura, why can't I have someone else too, she whined. It was just sex. I don't like them. It was just something I had to try. Listen, stupid, I said. Call Laura and ask her the truth. I never had sex with her. I loved you, Tammy Joe. You were always enough for me. I never needed anyone else. And if that was anything, what tormented you should not have tormented you much, because there was a lot left of you. Then I left, leaving her screaming and crying on the terrace. I gave a copy of the prenuptial agreement to my new lawyer. He asked me when and where I wanted the documents to be served. I had no idea, so I told him to wait. I took out my cell phone and called home. When Tammy Joe answered, I pretended to be upset. Damn it, TJ, I've loved you for so long that I just don't know how to live without you now, I said. It's one thing to be mad at you for the last week or so, but suddenly I'm faced with the fact that you're not in my life at all. I'm furious as hell, but I'm not sure I can handle it. Can we have one more time, talk about it, I asked her. Yes, Danny, she said. Anything you want, darling. I'll do anything. I love you so much. Dinner, I said. Texas Roadhouse. Six o'clock in the evening. Put on that tight red dress. Should I wear panties underneath, she asked. Maybe not, I said, as if thinking about it. But, Tammy Joe, whether you wear panties or not, you need to know two things before you go to this meeting. First, you need to come there prepared to tell me the truth about everything that happened and why. Okay, she said. Danny, what's the second thing? Second, whether you're wearing panties or not, you'll be shocked. Ooh, honey, I like the sound of that, she smiled. I turned to the lawyer. Submit your documents at six o'clock, I said. Serve them at Texas Roadhouse. He just shook his head as I left. I know he was thinking about what a bastard I was, but he didn't know the whole story. The next few weeks were intense. She hired a lawyer and tried to contest the divorce. My lawyer thought it was funny. She did not try to change the prenuptial agreement or annul it. She wasn't trying to get more money or a house or anything. She just didn't want a divorce. She placed a full-page ad in the local newspaper declaring her love for me. I remained adamant and determined. Eventually the divorce was approved and I was free to start rebuilding my life. I wasn't as terrible as you think. I could have walked away and left her with just that 20,000, but I didn't. I truly and truly loved her. Therefore, I did not want her to be left without a livelihood. I gave her a third of our savings and investments and a house. It seems that this was not enough. She spent some of the money on therapy. She spent a little more on several cruises that were supposed to help people solve sexual problems. I knew she was working on these things because she kept texting me to let me know about it. She often showed up at my new apartment and tried to talk to me or something. One of the most brazen occasions was my birthday. She came in heels and a raincoat with nothing underneath. She told me that every year since we met, we had sex on our birthdays, even before we got married so she saw no reason to stop now. It was a really interesting offer for me, but I refused. She didn't want to accept it, and I had to call the police. I missed her terribly, but I tried to move on. It was like trying to throw her a going-away party, but the bitch just refused to leave. One morning, shortly after this event, I was driving to work and due to a road closure due to construction, I had to take another street, since I had never driven down this street before, 
I saw a lot of things I had never seen before. One of them was a small cafe with a small outdoor terrace. It looked like one of those little sidewalk cafes. For some reason, I decided to stop by and have breakfast. I don't know why I did it, but I'm glad I did. I sat there in the morning, eating a light breakfast, bacon, muffins, and a cup of coffee. I was thinking about how bad my life was when this happened. I was unhappy. My marriage was over. I got divorced just under a year ago and couldn't get over TJ because she refused to let me do it. I also couldn't forget TJ because, let's face it, her body was hard to forget. Even though her belly continued to grow over the past year and she was close to becoming a real pig, I couldn't forget her. Help came in the most unexpected situation. Right as I sat there, drowning in my coffee, my luck changed. I was sitting in a cafe having breakfast with my limited edition sports car, a Ford GT, parked just a few meters away. Even though the car was already a year old, it attracted an incredible amount of attention. Right when I was about to get out and drive it to work, a truck hit it. The sound of the collision was so loud that everyone in the area heard it. Pieces of the car's carbon and aluminum body scattered across half the block. The car was an engineering marvel. Its production processes were almost surgically precise and of high quality. But apparently they don't make them like they used to, because the 15-year-old F-150 Super Cub that hit her was barely scratched. At first I was shocked, and then I ran to see if the truck driver was injured. I opened the door and stared into the most frightened eyes I've ever seen. They were so pure green that I lost my train of thought. The angel's face, surrounded by a halo of red hair, simply left me speechless. I would run over Tammy Joe with a bulldozer just to get a look at this woman. I asked her if everything was okay, and she shrugged, looking back at me. I guess so, she said. I knew my brakes were bad, but I didn't think they would fail. SHH, I said. Never give unnecessary information. The owner of the car you destroyed may try to use it against you in court. Oh, thanks, she said. What kind of car was it? Is it badly damaged? I can't afford to pay much for repairs. Ah, don't worry about it, I said. Your insurance company will pay. SHH, she said, looking at me conspiratorially. I don't have insurance. You're in trouble, I said. Not yet, she smiled. That's not what I meant, I said. That car was expensive, and a lot of people saw you crash into it. I'm pretty sure it's completely totaled. When you say, dear, how much are you talking about? She asked. I'm pretty sure it was over a hundred thousand, I said. I saw her face tense, and suddenly she looked like she was going to fall. I managed to catch her before she fell to the ground. All her silky red hair flew away as I carried her onto the grass and laid her down carefully. The first thing I noticed about it was how light it was. She was shorter than Tammy Jo and much slimmer. She weighed just over a hundred pounds. She woke up and smiled at me. An ambulance arrived immediately. The technicians moved me aside and began to take care of her. They said she was fine and told her it was still worth going to the hospital for testing. The police came and talked to me. Her eyes got so big it was almost funny. She was so apologetic that you could see it all over her face. I'm so sorry about this, she said. If it takes me a lifetime, I'll pay you back. The look on her face was so sincere and sincerely apologetic that it melted my heart. I almost missed it when she added, as soon as I find a job or a place to live. Where have you lived so far? I asked. In my truck, she said. But now the police have taken him away. I started laughing as hard as I could. The rest of the day passed very quickly. We went to the hospital and examined her. Other than a few bruises from the blow, she was fine. Since she felt she owed me something, I convinced her to stay in my spare room until her truck was released. I assured her that the door was locked and she could use it. Promise me that you won't try anything funny she said. I gave her my word, and she nodded her head. I wouldn't want to hurt you, because you were so nice to me, she said seriously. I took her shopping, and she didn't like it. 
I bought her a few outfits similar to what she wore, consisting of jeans and sneakers, but insisted that she also buy some skirts and nice blouses, as well as a couple of nice pairs of shoes. I already owe you more money than I will ever earn in my entire life, she said. Why do I need all these dressy things? I appreciate jeans, but I'm not going to wear these skirts. You have to, Ellie, I said. You can't wear jeans to work. I don't have a job, Daniel James Payne, she grinned. I think I can get you a job where I work, I said. Cleaning or storage, she asked. You'll see tomorrow when we get there, I laughed. I drove Allison home to my apartment. She really liked it and walked around looking at everything. She offered to cook something, but I told her she was too shaken up from the accident and ordered us Bachelor's best friend. The pizza was hot and delicious, especially in her company. Allison took a warm bath while we waited for delivery and we ran into our first problem. She came out of the bathroom wearing only a towel. We bought her new underwear, but we didn't buy her nightwear. I gave her an old pair of my pajamas and she rolled up the sleeves and the legs and it became the sexiest lingerie I had ever seen. She fell asleep in front of the fireplace, and I covered her with a blanket and went to my room to sleep. I'd only known Allison for a little over twelve hours, and it was the first time in a long time that I hadn't even thought about Tammy Jo. The next morning she woke up on the couch and looked around. She went into the bathroom just as I was coming out. Put on one of the skirts and blouses, I said. We're going to work. I introduced Allison to my colleagues and partners. This is Allison, my new assistant, I said. She looked at me rather strangely. She turned out to be a very fast learner and worked hard. In less than a month, it worked very efficiently. We ran into several problems. Police declared her truck a road hazard. He could only be released to a qualified garage. Fixing the truck would have cost more than it was worth. She was given a fine for not having insurance, which I lent her. Allison cooked and cleaned the apartment in addition to working as my assistant. I told her that I have a cleaner to clean, and I thought that Ellie was probably too tired after working every day to do this. It's not a burden to me, she said. After everything you've done for me, it's the least I can do. But you won't have to worry about me for a long time. Why? I asked. I found an apartment today, she said. It's small and nowhere near as good as this. But I can easily afford it with the salary you're overpaying me. So maybe I can start paying you back. I was stunned, but I simply nodded my head. I think I should have told her that I didn't want her to leave. But for some reason I just couldn't say it. Perhaps because of the way Tammy Joe manipulated me, I didn't say anything. The next big shock came a couple of weeks later when we returned home and she announced that she had a date. One of the guys at work was kind enough to ask me out on a date, she said. He's going to show me around the city. I wondered what else he wanted to show her, but he said nothing. While Allison was getting ready for the date, I was stewing. When she came out, she looked great. I got more angry. I was even angrier than when I caught Tammy Joe with Ken. I didn't say a word to her. I was still hoping this guy came to the door so I could fire him the next day. Okay, I'm leaving, she said cheerfully. Don't wait, I might be very late. Just go, I said. She smiled at me and opened the door. She looked at me again as if I had to do or say something. What did she expect? Should I have politely told her to go out and have a good time while I sat here wishing she was with me? Does Hallmark make a I hope you had good sex greeting card. I spent the entire evening pacing around the apartment. At 22 Zed, I thought about calling her, but didn't. I was saved from this when my phone rang. I answered, thinking it was her. Allison, are you okay? I blurted out. Is that the name of that little red-headed bitch you asked for dinner? Tammy Joe's angry voice asked. What the hell is your problem, Danny? I am in therapy and doing everything I can to repair our marriage. You can't even spare me on our birthdays, but you can invite a stranger to dinner every day. I almost started laughing. I would have done that if I wasn't so angry at Allison. Tammy Joe, 
The term divorce means that we are no longer married. We don't have a marriage that you can restore. You should have gone out and experimented with cheating with other people. I didn't share this need. Now we're both free. Do whatever we want. You can go out and rock out, or have sex parties, or whatever you call it. I can invite some pretty redheads to dinner. I don't know Danny, Tammy Jo said. She's so tiny. I might have to ruin it. If you care about her at all, you better get rid of her. I just laughed and hung up. At one o'clock in the morning, Allison returned to the apartment. I ran to my room when I heard her open the door. The next morning she didn't say a word, but she looked very happy indeed. I avoided talking to her all day and didn't invite her to lunch. When she came into my part of the office at lunchtime, I told her I was too busy to stop working, but she could enjoy her lunch. She said we could order something and bring it here. I said I wasn't hungry and couldn't afford to be distracted. She looked offended, but Carolyn immediately led her away. My cell phone rang at three o'clock in the afternoon. Good decision, Danny, Tammy Joe said. I really meant to hurt that little girl. You belong to me and I will get you back. Besides, she's not your type. I hung up again. The next four nights were a repeat of the previous one. It seemed like Allison had dates every damn night. Things got worse between us. Finally, I asked her when she was going to leave. I just couldn't take it anymore. Soon was all she said. But for some reason she didn't seem happy about it. That night, a little after Allison left for her date, someone knocked on my door. I thought it might be Tammy Joe, but it was Joe Dawson, the head of maintenance at my apartment complex. He was a good guy, and we became friendly, if not friends. Mr. Payne, why are you treating her like this? he asked. With whom? I asked him back. I was sure Tammy Joe had something to do with it. With Miss Ellison, he said. Why are you so mean to her? This woman is crazy about you. You're everything she talks about. Look, I know you had a bad divorce and your ex-wife is a bitch, but Allison isn't like that. She doesn't deserve this crap you. I raised my hand to stop him. What the hell are you talking about, Joe? I asked. Well, you bring your women home every damn night, right in front of her, and then you make her leave the apartment so you can. He said, I started laughing and opened the door wider, showing him my empty house. Joe, you're completely wrong, I said. Allison is the one who goes out on dates. She goes out every damn night. He suddenly looked at me strangely. Then he laughed loudly. Sorry to bother you, Mr. Payne. His laughter made me angry. Joe, what's going on? I asked. He looked at me and laughed again. It's the same thing my mother did to my father, he said. Looks like you got caught too. Come with me. I followed Joe down the hall. We walked through the hall and into the laundry room. Each apartment had its own washer and dryer, so very few residents ever visited the laundry room. He carefully opened the door wide and told me to look inside. There, sitting on a chair, reading a book and yawning, was Allison. I stepped back from the door. Her date must have been cancelled tonight, I said. Poor girl. I wonder why she didn't just come home. She does this every night, he said. I got a little mad because she was trying to play with me like Tammy Joe. I knew how to deal with it. But I was also relieved to know that she wasn't actually dating anyone. Two hours later Joe called me and told me Allison was coming home. I left the apartment and turned off all the lights. He walked down the back stairs, got into his car, and drove down the street. A few minutes later I saw Allison looking out the door of the building, checking to see if my car had left. I waited half an hour and then returned home. My zipper was undone, there were lipstick marks on my collar, and my shirt was not buttoned properly, as if I was getting dressed in the dark. When I walked into the room, Allison was sitting on the couch with her arms crossed and looking angry. The fire in her green eyes was truly frightening. Where have you been? She almost shouted at me. She got up from the sofa and walked over to me to take a closer look at me. I had a date too, I said, smiling. 
she saw the unzipped zipper and lipstick on my collar. She started crying and ran to her room. I knocked on the door. Only sobs could be heard from inside. I slowly opened the door and saw her lying face down on the bed. I could hardly resist laughing. Over the past few weeks, I've realized that, although I haven't said anything about it, I have very strong feelings for Allison. I guess, even though it hurt me to see her in pain, part of me felt like she deserved it for the games she played. If she was trying to manipulate me like Tammy Jo, I wanted nothing to do with her. She turned to me and my heart melted. She looked so pathetic that I wanted to scold myself for hurting her. I'll leave in the morning while you're at work, she said, unless you want me to leave early. Allison, don't, I said. How could I be so stupid, she asked, sobbing. At this point, I noticed how quickly she could go from extremely attractive to quite funny as soon as she started crying. Take any attractive woman, make her face contort with tears and crying, and you will understand what I am talking about. The thought of this made me laugh again. I never wanted to do this, she cried. It was Caroline's idea. And look where it led. Ellie, what are you talking about? I asked. Perhaps she mistook my surprised expression for indifference or mockery, because in the blink of an eye her sadness turned to anger. Oh God, you're such a jerk, she exploded. Why couldn't I fall in love with someone who wasn't broken? I was stunned. My eyes widened in surprise as she glared at me. You, I said, pointing at her. Love, I added, and I had to admit that the word sounded bitter and foreign on my tongue. I never expected to say that word again after Tammy Jo. Me, I asked curiously. Why do you even need to know this? She exploded. It's just one more thing for you to laugh at while you go on dates with all the women who cross your path. What are you talking about, Ellie? I asked. I'm not stupid, she exploded. You come home smelling like perfume. There's lipstick on your collar, and your clothes are all a mess from your date. Well, let's look at the evidence, Ellie, I said. Maybe you really are stupid. She looked at me as if she was about to say something, but I interrupted her by covering her mouth with my hand. Can we discuss this calmly without all the shouting? I asked her. She nodded, and as soon as I removed my hand, she started again. I just wanted to. She shouted before I interrupted her again. This time I covered her mouth with mine. Allison has the softest, sweetest lips I've ever touched. At first she resisted, and then she disappeared into me. Finally, she wrapped her arms around me and started kissing me back. She rolled me onto my back and greedily devoured my lips. Then, suddenly, she pulled away. I shouldn't have done that. You just came back from some bitch and you called me stupid, she said. Then why are you doing this? I asked, teasing her. Because I she said before pursing her lips. Love me, I said mockingly. No, it's not like that, she snapped. You already said it. There's no going back, I said. Ellie, look at the lipstick on my collar. She looked at him and seemed to become even angrier. Where else do you have lipstick, she asked. There on your dressing table, Ellie, I said. This is your lipstick, brilliant, and the perfume you smelled is also yours. She just looked at me strangely. I just beat you at your game, I said. Ellie, if I wanted to go left with anyone, it would be you. Your plan worked. I was really jealous of the guys you dated, but I just couldn't say anything. After what my ex did to me, it's hard to trust someone. Ellie simply nodded and held out her hands to me. I wanted to know if I could trust her, so I didn't tell her what I knew. I wanted to see if she would confess. For five nights in a row you went on dates, and I sat at home feeling jealous, I said. I wanted you to know that I can come out too and let you feel what it's like. I didn't want to do it, she said. Caroline told me that you were broken and that you would never let me know how you felt about me unless I pushed you. All I ever wanted was for you to tell me not to go. Then I would know if you feel something for me, but you never did, so I had to continue the affair. At first we tried to hide it at work, but everyone there knew us too well. Within two days people were looking at me and saying things like, 
Wow, looks like you finally pulled your head out of your ass. There was also my favorite. Damn, Danny, whatever substances you're on, sign me up too. Of course, Caroline was the first to understand everything. This woman is extraordinary. That's probably why Marty married her. We just returned from a staff meeting. All three partners were there, George, Marty and myself, as well as Caroline, Tom and Allison. Caroline looked back and forth between Ellie and me. Suddenly Caroline, known for her insight but not her tact, suddenly blurted out, You two are sleeping, aren't you? My God, you're in love, she said. Carrie, what makes you think something so absurd? asked her husband. Marty was one of my best and longest time friends. There is no chance he would want anything to do with any woman. Although hearing that won't stop you from constantly trying to set him up with someone. Allison, come and stand next to him, Caroline ordered. Allison came and stood next to me. She carefully avoided looking at me. See, Caroline shouted. Did you see how she lit up just now? Damn, how could I not notice that? This June marked two very important changes in my life. First, I married Allison, and we bought a big, beautiful house together to start our life together. Secondly, I bought myself a brand new custom Mustang Shelby GT 500KR Super Snake. Driving this car is an experience. It's not a sports car like the GT. This is a muscle car. Difference is a very American issue. The car has so much power that my tires don't last more than a couple of months, and driving is a much more tangible experience. When I hit the gas, the seat pushes me forward so hard it's breathtaking. At the same time, the opposition between the car's acceleration and the resisting G-forces makes you feel like you're being squeezed in a vice. The GT had a lot of power, but this thing has almost 800 horsepower. It's amazing. I also keep her away from anything Allison drives. I bought her a new F-150, but I just can't get this woman away from the trucks. Of course, Allison is my soulmate. We don't have any of the doubts or conflicts that I had with Tammy Jo. We fit each other like tires and wheels. One without the other, we are good for nothing. Speaking of Tammy Jo, when she found out I was getting married again, she was furious. The first meeting with her and Ellie was not pretty. A famous line from the movie Aliens was used. Get away from him, bitch. Tammy Jo screamed at the top of her lungs. Allison calmly walked up to her and looked her up and down. Tammy Jo was breathing so hard she was almost hyperventilating. Let me tell you, a lot of the men out there ruined their perfectly good fruit of the weave panties watching her huge breasts expand and contract with every breath. I was proud of myself because it seemed like I had grown. Her giant, quivering tits didn't give me the usual reaction. My days of being stunned, mesmerized, and subjugated by her breasts were clearly over. Here she is, right? Allison asked. She looked at me, and I nodded. Well, she'll never have to worry about drowning. If you don't leave my husband alone, I will. Tammy Jo began. No, no. Allison said calmly, shaking her head. He's not your husband anymore. You're divorced. It was just a stupid legal formality, Tammy Jo snorted. She has gotten better since I last saw her. Everything seemed concentrated in the three B.S. breasts. Ass and belly became larger. I have three words for you, Tammy Jo shouted. Leave Danny alone. I have two for you, Ellie said. Squats and breath fresheners. I laughed until I dropped. It was really funny. At the same time, it was also hot, having two women fighting over me. It also really helped me realize more than anything else that I have moved forward in my life. Allison was everything I ever wanted in a woman. Comparing not only the two women, but also the differences in my feelings towards them, was cathartic. With Tammy Jo, it was teenage love. It burned very brightly, but was full of ups and downs. I was constantly jumping through hoops to impress her. It seemed to me that I had to constantly re-win her love. It was like I was under a microscope every day. I loved her terribly, but we were simply incompatible. 
we were always trying new things because we needed a constant source of new experiences to keep our relationship fresh and not let it stagnate. Tammy Jo had a need for sexual experimentation for two reasons. Although she would never admit it, she was obsessed with having sex with multiple partners, in which she lost her virginity and was determined to prove that it didn't break her. The second reason was that although she claimed to love me, and I really couldn't deny that completely, I didn't think I was enough for her. That's why it was so important that I participate in sex parties with her. She was getting the sex she needed, but still kept me for her emotional needs. With Ellie, it was different. We were the same or compatible in every aspect of our relationship. We didn't need to experiment or anything like that. We were happy just to be together. Our love was not characterized by the ups and downs that I went through with TD. We just loved each other no matter what. I didn't have to prove myself to her and vice versa. We each knew that we would be together forever. When Ellie told me she loved me, it was more than words, I could feel it. The next big laugh of my life came when I came home one day to find Tammy Jo sitting on my couch. I was ready to call the police because I was not prone to violence against women. Tammy Jo, where's Ellie? I shouted. I really thought she might have hurt her or done something. I'm here, silly, Ellie said from behind me. I turned around and hugged her as best I could. Danny, I'm fine, she said. Tammy Jo just came to apologize. What? I asked, sure that this was a trick. My therapist told me that I finally need to accept that I lost you due to my own selfish actions and move on. Tammy Jo said. Allison had nothing to do with our breakup, and I was wrong to lash out at her. I came here to apologize, and she was generous enough to accept my apology. I hope that in time, when the pain of my actions goes away, you and I can be friends too, Tammy Jo said. She smiled, seemingly sincerely. Wow, give this bitch an Oscar, I thought. But in the days that followed, it seemed that I was wrong. Tammy Jo and Allison seemed to be becoming friends. Over the following weeks, they began to spend more and more time together. It wasn't unusual for me to come home to find them lounging by our pool in their swimsuits. And every time Ellie wasn't looking, TD would bend over so that I was sure to see her breasts or ass. We even had dinner together a few times, and I have to admit that it wasn't too bad, and we had a good time. Tammy Jo then played her card. One night after we had a barbecue, she proposed. We all ate delicious food and felt good under the moonlight. Why don't we go inside the house, Tammy Jo said. I'm not sure I want to watch a movie on a night like this, I said. All this romantic moonlight makes me think differently. Exactly what I was saying, Tammy Jo said. Her voice was so filled with lust that the words blurred together. She sounded like she was drunk even though neither of us had drunk more than a beer or two. What the hell are you talking about, T.D.? Ellie asked. She rose to her feet, her fur standing on end. Allison, you're Danny's wife. I was Danny's wife. We have that in common, Tammy told Joe. You told me you understood when I told you I still loved him. I also told you that I have very strong feelings for you. I think we should all be in a relationship together. I don't want to fight you over it. Let's share it and share with each other, too. Bitch, you need to get out of my house right now, Ellie said. It was the angriest I've ever seen her. Look, girl, I let you keep him for now, but you don't have what it takes to satisfy Danny long term, Tammy told Joe. She adjusted her bodice and accidentally let one of her breasts out from under her clothes. Is it true, Danny? Ellie asked, looking at me with a sharp look. It was like in Star Trek, when enemy ships scan each other to assess the situation and the strength of their enemy. Hell no, I said. I told you from the beginning that I wanted nothing to do with her. Honey, I also told you what Tammy Jo is like. To quote Rick James, the girl is a super freak. I told you about her trying to get me into sex parties and everything. But I also told you, too many times to count, that you and I are forever and we don't need anyone. I divorced Tammy Jo because I wasn't enough for her. I love you so much more than I ever loved her. 
I wouldn't want to share you with anyone, ever. Get out of my house, Allison told Tammy Joe. There's something perverted about you. You don't look like a real woman. You're like those fake women in pre-adult movies who have sex with other women so men can watch. They make you think that every guy has a fantasy of seeing two women together. I've never met a woman in real life who would want to do that. Even if they do exist, I'm just not one of them. And your plan also assumes that I'm willing to share my husband with you. That will never happen. I'm enough for him. You just made the worst mistake of your life, baby, Tammy snapped at Joe. I'll still get him back. But now it will cost you a lot more and will probably be very painful. Just watch. You'll look back on this and wish you'd accepted my offer. We could all be very happy together. Danny is mine, but out of the nobility of my heart, I was going to share it with you. Tammy Joe looked at me. Danny, I went to therapy and cured all my sexual problems. But to be honest, it wasn't the therapists that cured me. Anyone can change if they really want to. I realized that a lot of guys who didn't care about me. Using my body didn't give me half the pleasure that lying on the couch and watching a movie with you gave me. I changed for you. I was willing to share you if necessary, just to bring you back into my life. But this would only be temporary. We didn't see Tammy Joe again in the weeks that followed. We heard stories and just assumed she got angry and lost her temper. I heard stories about her pleasuring groups of guys in bars and other things that I really hoped weren't true. Deep down, I felt sorry for Tammy Joe. My accountant also told me that Tammy Joe almost squandered all the money I gave her during the divorce. If she hadn't slowed down, she might even have lost her house because she missed her last mortgage payment. Even if she slowed down, if I didn't give her another large sum of money, she would have to find a job. We also heard that Tammy Joe started dating Bobby McGillicuddy. Bobby was the son of Mayor McGillicuddy. He was several years younger than Tammy Joe and I, but he made up for his inexperience with his ability to get into trouble and be a real jerk. It started when he went to college. I remember hearing about no less than three cases of sexual assault against him. Two of them were settled out of court, and the third was reduced to second-degree criminal sexual misconduct. Second-degree criminal sexual misconduct earned Bobby probation and community service. He was also placed on the county's sex offender registry, but that spared him a lengthy prison sentence. Somehow this was never mentioned in the press, so his father continued to run for re-election. I wondered why the hell Tammy Joe would hang out with someone like Bobby. But then it started to make sense to me. In fact, they have a lot in common. Both of them were quite extravagant sexually. Bobby may have been wild enough to keep Tammy Joe from getting bored. And Tammy Joe definitely didn't mind, so Bobby could avoid jail. Then there was the fact that Tammy Joe needed money and Bobby was the mayor's son. It was a match made in hell. Two weeks later, I had the worst experience of my life. I was about to return home, thinking about Allison, when my old friend Dave Peterson, who was now the county sheriff, drove up to me. Danny, I need you to come with me to the hospital, he said. Danny. I'm so sorry. Dave, what are you talking about? I asked. He was driving me to the hospital with the siren on. I was sure Ellie was dead. Dave told me no, but didn't say anything else. When I arrived there, the doctors had difficulty looking me in the eye. They led me to a small room where I opened the door and saw Ellie curled up against the wall. I approached her and started talking. I asked what was wrong. She didn't look me in the face or talk to me. Tears rolled down her face and she curled up even more. I began to gently massage her back and she sighed. I started to move away from her and she moaned. That's a good sign, said a voice behind me. I turned around and saw a curvaceous but attractive older woman. She turned out to be Dr. Ellie. You're the first person she's allowed to touch her since we found her this afternoon, the woman told me. What the hell happened to her? I asked. Your wife was drugged and assaulted, the woman said slowly and carefully. I realized that she was trying to keep her emotions to herself. Who? I hissed. We don't know yet, and she's not telling the police or anyone else anything, 
the doctor said. She seemed less traumatized than I expected. Danny, a quiet voice said from behind us. I left the doctor standing and walked up to Ellie. Yes, honey, I said. Do you still want to be married to me? She asked in a quiet, barely audible voice. Ellie, are you crazy? I asked. I've loved you since the first day I saw you. Remember when you crashed my car? I still owe you for this, she muttered. Ellie, you've already paid me back, I said. How? she asked. With all the love you give me, darling, it's worth so much more than the car, I said. Take me home, Danny, she said. These people are stupid. They can't help me. I just need you to take care of me. I want to go home now. I took off my jacket to cover hers and picked her up. She was still so small, but she seemed even more fragile. The doctor tried to stand in front of me, but one look from my hardening eyes told her that it would be inappropriate. Sir, we still have tests to do and... She looked at me again and saw the anger in my eyes. Well, we've done everything that's really necessary, but we'd like to see her again, um, when you can bring her back. I nodded and carried her out to my car. Before I reached the door, Dave approached us. Danny, I need to ask her some questions. Dave, she's a victim, not a criminal, I said. You should be looking for the bastards who did this. There must be someone out there somewhere who saw something. You should really hope you find them before I do. You remember what I'm capable of, don't you? Dave suddenly stepped back and reflexively put his hand on the gun. Sorry, Danny, he said. I sat down on the chair near the door with Ellie on my lap. I waved to the guard who approached. You're a law enforcement professional, right? I asked. The guard puffed out his chest. You saw what happened between me and the sheriff a few moments ago, right? I asked. You mean when he grabbed his service weapon? Asked the guard. That's enough, thank you, I said. As the guard walked away, confused, Dave looked at me. What was it? he asked. Now I have a witness that, for no reason at all, you almost pulled a gun on me while I was holding the victim of a crime that your department failed to solve. I don't think the newspapers or voters will appreciate knowing that people, those who are supposed to protect them, are threatening unarmed citizens instead of protecting them, I said. But Danny, it's not like that, he said. Dave, until it's decided, that's how it will be. I'll get lawyers and private security and whatever else to keep her safe. Danny, can I come over to your house later today? It'll just be me and ask her a few questions, he asked. She's been through a lot, I said. I'll call you when she's ready. It took several days before Ellie felt better. Dave came and asked her his questions. I knew he had to do this to even try to find those who were responsible but it was still hard for me to watch. Finally, Dave asked me to leave the room. My instincts to protect her from any trouble worked against us. When Dave left, I was filled with anger again. I could see how hard it was for her to describe what happened and all she could remember about the men, that is, the animals, who did it was like tearing a wound open again before it had a chance to heal. We'll get through this, Ellie, I told her. We'll be fine. You don't want me to leave? she asked. I was shocked again. Ellie, why are you even asking? I asked. I love you more than anything in this world. Why the hell would I want you to leave? It's hard for me to even go to work because we have to be apart for so long. She just smiled and grabbed my hand. I love you too, you fool, she said with one tear running down her cheek. But not everyone thinks so. Anyone who promised to be with you forever would, I said firmly. Not if they think I'm damaged goods, she said. I just looked at her. I didn't understand what she was talking about, but I knew that when she was ready, she would tell me. It took several weeks before Ellie really started to improve. Some things recovered faster than others. For the first few days after what happened, we never separated. We even had to go to the bathroom together. She couldn't stand it if I left her for even a few moments. Believe me, it was torture. No man in his right mind wants to see some of the things women do in the bathroom. 
I'm still amazed at some of the things my wonderful wife does on a regular basis. One of the things that I expected would take a long time to recover from was our sex life. I was wrong. Almost immediately after the bruises healed, Ellie wanted me. It was as if she had to make sure that our connection here remained intact. I made love to her very gently and very slowly, and she just didn't want it to end. This was one of those moments that convinced me that we were okay. The challenge was getting Ellie to leave the house and feel comfortable around other people. Tammy Jo came to visit us one evening and again apologized for her behavior earlier. She noticed how much Ellie had changed, but claimed that she had not heard about what happened to her. This made my alarm bells ring loud and clear because almost everyone who came to offer us their condolences and well wishes communicated with Tammy Jo on a regular basis. If they knew everything, why didn't she? I had a bad feeling about this whole situation. Throughout the entire ordeal, I tried not to ask Ellie about how it happened, what happened, or how many there were. I wanted her to understand that the most important thing to me was that she survived, and she knew that I still loved her and always would. Where I come from, a woman who has kissed another man at least once is considered an available girl. Her man will no longer have anything to do with her. If he does this, he is considered not a man. I was absolutely sure I was going to lose her, and she was the best thing that ever happened to me. Ellie, you'll never lose me unless it's because I go to jail for killing the people who did this to you, I told her. We went into the house and hugged each other until we fell asleep. Now I realize that was the wrong thing to say. It's been months since the attack, and Dave, your department still hasn't learned anything. You called her several times and asked her statements, but you didn't have a clue. I understand now that you knew about Bobby and possibly his friends all along. You turned a blind eye to it, Dave. You smirked at your duty for the sake of your job. Dave tried to say something, but didn't. A few weeks later, one of the guys who held Ellie's hands while Bobby had sex with her died. He died of an overdose or something. We didn't know he was one of them until Bobby told us about it. Didn't tell. The other one was killed two weeks ago. Bobby told me about it too. He said it was a hunting accident. I think Ellie knew, but she had nothing to do with their deaths. But at the time I had my own problems, I said. You see, I felt like my world was falling apart. I was sure I was going to lose the only thing that really meant to me. Ellie and I moved on. We realized you'd probably never catch them, Dave. I started hinting to Ellie that it was time for us to start a family. But she either avoided the topic or changed it. One day I tried to press her, and she said it was just not the time in our lives. Maybe in a month or so, she claimed. I, I was her, of course. I thought, I always thought, that the woman I love would want to have children with me. There was something wrong here. Then I got a call from Skunkzilla, I said, making a face at Tammy Jo. She pretended to be hurt and pretended that it hurt her to tell me. She told me about how women who have experienced traumatic events sometimes become distorted. She told me about Stockholm Syndrome and a couple of other really strange psychological conditions. She told me that if nothing will work out between me and Ellie, I can always go back to her. She also asked me to borrow money at the same time. I noticed then that Ellie was really acting strange. It broke my heart because I really couldn't imagine my life without her. But at the same time, my heart had already been broken and betrayed by someone who swore to love me forever. You know, it's like they say in Star Trek, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, I'm just a fool. So I hired someone to follow her. After just two days, he came back and said he had information for me. My heart broke. I couldn't believe this was happening to me again. When I looked at his report, I just wanted to cry. This morning, about half an hour after I left for work, Ellie got dressed up and went to a bar on the east side. She spent a lot of time drinking and talking to a man the private investigator didn't know. He had photographs. He showed me photos. Ellie was spending time with Bobby McGillicuddy. The worst part about it was what I found out later. She used our money to hire a private investigator and track him down. I also didn't know at the time that Bobby was the one who had her. 
while the other two just held her. I didn't know what to do or what to feel. I felt like my world was ending. I went home that night and just went to bed. Ellie came up to me and I didn't want to talk to her. I didn't want her to know, what do I know? So I tried to act normal, but I'm not that good at acting. She sensed something was wrong. She tried to hug me and talk to me, but I just told her I needed time. I said it was a problem at work, but I'm not sure she believed me. She got into bed with me and I just looked at her. Her angelic face showed no signs of what she was doing. Women are simply the best liars. No doubt about it. Looking into Ellie's eyes, I did not see the slightest sign of betrayal. The only thing is that I saw it was love and caring. God, I was such a fool. Maybe I deserved what she did to me, because unlike the situation with TD, I was angry, but damn, I still loved Ellie. I guess I wanted to know what I did wrong. Perhaps it was because she felt that I could not protect her. Perhaps that's why she didn't want to have children with me. I couldn't understand why I felt so bad. It was at least twice as bad as what happened with Tammy Jo. The next morning was worse. I knew that I would have to divorce her. There was simply no way to deal with someone cheating on me. Love is one thing, stupidity is another. I loved Ellie enough to die for her if necessary, but not enough to let her deceive me. I went to work early to begin the divorce process. It was the first time for many things that day. It was the first time I left home without kissing Ellie goodbye. It was the first time a little later that I didn't pick up her call when she called me at work. A little later that day, my private investigator called me and said that he had intercepted a phone conversation between Bobby and Ellie. Ellie called him from her mobile phone. He replayed the conversation for me. Hey, baby, Ellie said. Can I see you today? Maybe, Bobby replied. What do you mean? I think it's time we got to know each other better, Ellie said. My heart broke again. I booked us a room at the Shangri-La Motel, Ellie said. We can meet at lunch, and I'll be home before Danny gets home from work. Why does every woman I know talk about this guy? Bobby asked. He's not that special. If you say anything bad about Danny, I won't sleep with you. I'll just beat you up, Ellie replied sharply. The anger in her voice was frightening. I wondered if she loves me so much. Why is she cheating on me? Okay, baby, Bobby said. Now I understand. He's not into kinky stuff, huh? As far as I know, Ellie wasn't either. But now nothing surprises me anymore. Exactly, my wife purred. If you play my game to the end, it will be something you have never experienced. Okay, baby, Bobby said. Now I get it. He's just not into that kind of stuff, huh? Apparently Ellie wasn't either. But now nothing surprises me anymore. That's right, dear, my wife purred. If you play by my rules until the end, it will be something you've never experienced before. She gave him directions to the motel and the room number. I screamed and threw the phone across the room. I walked over and picked it up. Sorry, man, my private investigator said. You're out of luck, but at least you can get rid of this bitch and start a new life. Trust me, I went through this myself. Just keep trying until you find a good one. With large tears running down my cheeks, I was able to tell him that I thought I had already found it. I sat down at my desk and stared at the computer. I didn't do anything that morning. I just sat and thought about Ellie. Thoughts of revenge came to mind. I could... No, I couldn't do that to her. But I could. No. I'd make that bitch pay for my damn car. Probably not. But I knew I wanted to do something with her. I had no intention of going quietly into that good night, or at least that day. Okay, I was chatting. Then I realized it was almost noon and Ellie would soon be meeting this idiot. I decided to crash her damn party and let her know she shouldn't come home. And maybe I should have kicked Bobby's ass for him. I jumped up and ran out to my Mustang. I had just started it when my cell phone rang. I answered, and it was Tammy Jo. She wanted to know how I was. She sounded so nice and told me that she had started a new life and just wanted to be my friend. I knew I would need friends in the coming days, 
so I talked to her while I was driving. When I arrived at the motel, I told T.D. that I would call her back later. She sounded so happy about it that I almost forgot what a bitch she was. This got me thinking, is it possible for people to change? But I realized that I was just expecting the loneliness that awaited me without Ellie in my life. I tried to use the T.D. as a lifeline to keep from. Drowning in the sea of despair, I was about to plunge into in a few moments. I realized that I would be even stupider if I kicked out one cheater, only to get involved with another again. I went to the room Ellie told Bobby about. When I looked out the window, I was shocked. Bobby was naked on the bed. His hands appeared to be handcuffed to the head of the bed. Allison stood over him, but was fully clothed. I've seen a few CFNM videos online, so it didn't seem unusual to me. While I watched Ellie just slap Bobby like she was beating the cowboy crap out of him, I remember her saying that he had to play her game to the end. I slowly turned the knob and opened the door. She was so busy with her lover that she didn't hear it. Now I could hear her telling him, and it didn't sound very romantic. You know what, idiot, I'll be a great mom, she said. It's a pity that I couldn't take your friends too, but they were already dead when I realized what I had to do. You'll never be anyone's mom, you psychopath, he said. You will be finished as soon as I am free. Who said you would be free, she asked. I'll do whatever it takes to protect Danny, so I can't let you go. Then I saw it in her hand. To me, it was a relatively small object, but in her hands, it seemed significant. In the museum's replica catalog, it is called a Venetian axe. This is a combat replica of a one-handed, single-headed battle axe, which was used in Italy in the 14th century. This is a beautiful item. It has a slightly curved handle wrapped in wire. It is made of chrome-plated steel with brass finishing. There is a brass lion motif on the back of the head. The front of the axe tapers to a sharp edge. Many axes were intended only for breaking or applying pressure to armor, and as such are not very sharp. This one was. Suddenly I realized it wasn't about sex. I'm missing something. Ellie didn't cheat on me. She just lured Bobby here for a different reason. What did she mean when she said she would do anything to protect me? Oh damn, you cut me, you crazy bitch, Bobby screamed. You don't need to protect your blessed husband. He's already doing all this karate bullshit. Besides, it was always because of him. Tammy Joe would tear us apart if anything happened to him. It was all, it was her idea. She just wanted to make him think you were a bitch, so she could have another chance at him. Then he tried to change tactics. Look, I'm sorry I got involved in this. I'm sorry for what we did to you. We really thought that with those things in your system, you'd like it. With that much crap in you, baby, you should have wanted everything you see. Thanks, that's all I needed to know, Ellie said. God, I wish you could tell that fat girl that I'm going to get her too. I'll tell her for you, he said. Just let. Even as he spoke, I watched as my wife raised my axe above her head. I couldn't let Ellie do this. I snuck up behind her. She closed her eyes and bit her lip. She really meant to do this. I grabbed her hand before she could put it down and kissed her. No, Ellie, I said, and kissed her again. Time stood still, and we both realized that we had both made a terrible mistake. A few weeks ago, when I mistakenly said I'd kill all those bastards, she thought I'd end up in jail. To prevent this, she decided to catch them herself. The first two died in accidents, but she tricked Bobby into actually having sex with her. I've been depressed the last few days. She thought it was because of my frustration with the whole situation. She pointed down next to the bed to the recording device that was still recording everything that was happening. She got Bobby to confess on tape and implicated Tammy Joe in it. I love you, Danny, she said. I just needed to get this over with so we could have kids. I didn't want to risk getting pregnant and then ending up in jail. Plus, what if I actually had to hurt this piece of shit and ended up in jail? You wouldn't want a prisoner's wife. If it were you, I would, I told her as we kissed each other hungrily. I thought you cheated on me, I said. She simply smiled and laughed. 
Danny, I already told you that I could never do this to anyone else. What do I need to do to convince you? And that's when it happened. We were so carried away by kissing that the axe slipped out of Ellie's hands and fell on the bed. The axe head, being the heaviest part, is designed to strike first, and in this case it struck. Unfortunately, the axe fell many times, Ligs Bobby. Bobby's screams could probably be heard in the next state, and as you can hear on the recording, Ellie and I didn't know what to do. I ran to the bathroom and got him a towel while Ellie called an ambulance. I threw him a towel and told him to keep pressure on the wound, but I wouldn't hold the bastard to it. I would prefer him to die. Luckily, the ambulance arrived before he bled out and went into shock or anything. So the bastard didn't die, but everything else was entirely his fault. The question here, Dave, is what are you going to do about it? You have Bobby admitting right here on this tape that he and two of his friends were the ones who attacked my wife. You also have his admission that it was Tammy Joe who made them do it. Everyone in the room looked at Dave. Tammy Joe made her way to the door. I'm sorry, Danny, she said, but that's your fault too. If you would just get rid of that little red-haired bitch, or at least let me share you with her, we'd all be happy now. Her confession was somehow reminiscent of the end of every Scooby-Doo episode where the villain says, and I could get away with it, too, if it weren't for those meddling kids. She tried to push past the two deputies at the door, but they didn't move. Danny, you put me in a difficult position, Dave said. With this tape, his only son could spend a long time in prison. Even though it was an accident, I think I could still blame you or Allison for this and possibly free Bobby. But I'm willing to offer a deal. Give me the tape and you and the redhead just walk out of here. Everyone goes home and we forget about the whole thing. This never happened. As far as anyone knows, Bobby had his dignity cut off in an industrial accident. What do you say? Martha, I asked. Martha simply looked at her shoes. Joe did the same. Even my own lawyer couldn't meet my eyes. He slept with Martha. Ellie whispered in my ear as we looked at him. Honey, we need another lawyer. Since he slept with Martha and she, like Dave, was appointed mayor, they were all inclined to go along with the farce. I took a deep breath. Joe, you're fired, I said. You are no longer my company's lawyer. You will no longer receive business from us. He looked annoyed, but knew I was serious. Martha, I have always admired you. I always thought that in addition to being attractive, you were honest and dedicated to the law and justice of this city. I was wrong. The people of this city will miss you. What the hell are you talking about, she said. It's you or me. If I don't agree to this nonsense, I might lose my job. What about your honor and self-respect, I asked. It's easy for you to talk about this nonsense, she answered sharply. Your company practically prints money. The rest of us have to live with the circumstances. Try to pay your mortgage with honor. Try to pay off your car loan with self-respect, and then come back and talk to me about it. Dave, you were one of my best friends growing up. I really expected you to stop licking the mayor's ass and make the right choice, I said. Danny, this is the right choice for me and my family. I have children to feed. But look at it this way. He won't be able to do this crap to other women anymore, even if they can reattach his dick, Dave said looking at the floor. And Danny, Tammy Jo will get hers too. Every time she looks at you two together, she beats herself up for what she lost. You and Allison have enough money to just move somewhere else. Okay, Dave, I said. I really hoped it wouldn't come to that. Until what? He asked sadly. Mustang, I said loudly. Everyone in the room looked at me like I was crazy. Danny, why are you shouting? What kind of car do you have? Dave asked. What does that even have to do with it? That's the code word I was told to shout, I replied. He looked at me puzzled. Within seconds, several heavily armed men in vests with the words FBI or state police burst into the room. They handcuffed Tammy Joe, Martha, and Dave. Dave's two deputies were warned not to interfere. 
Another man in a business suit entered after everyone was secured. Dave recognized him, as did Martha and Joe. It was the state attorney general. Dave and Martha were charged with breach of public trust and conspiracy to obstruct justice. The mayor will likely be drawn into the matter as well. Bobby was charged with assault, and Tammy Joe was charged with solicitation of a crime and conspiracy. Joe will likely lose his license to practice law for violating professional ethics. The attorney general assured me that Bobby's incident was probably just an accident and neither Ellie nor I would be charged, especially given the circumstances and the conspiracy to keep her attackers out of jail. After a few minutes, he told us that we could go home, but should not leave the city. We'll need to testify, but we have a strong case against all of them. Then Ellie and I were left alone. She kissed me again, and we walked out to my extremely powerful Mustang. We felt as if the weight of the world had been lifted from our shoulders. Can we come back for my car tomorrow or send someone to get it? She asked. Right now, I just need to be close to you, idiot. Why am I a fool? I asked. Oh, there are too many reasons to list, she said. Just trust me, you're an idiot. Well, if I'm such an idiot, why do you want to get in my car? Besides, maybe I should just let Joe serve you with the divorce papers he's working on, I said. She looked for a moment as if she had been hit. The smile on her face disappeared, instantly replaced by a frown. Her face became paler, as if all the blood had drained from her just as quickly. You were, she began. Ellie, I'm sorry, I said. I thought that. Fool she said. You really are a fool, Danny, but you are my fool. Please don't ever forget that. And Joe won't be a lawyer anytime soon, so he won't be able to give me any trouble. Name one, I said. Let me listen to one. DJP Square, she said. What are you talking about? We both asked at the same time and smiled. You first, I said. I wanted to hear some of these reasons why I'm a fool. Okay, she said, but don't be mad if I continue. You're a fool because you don't really understand how much I love you. Danny, without you I'd be lost. You're the most important thing in. No, that's not even that. You my world. The second reason, how could you even think that I could cheat on you? This goes beyond a simple fool. This is already like brain damage. But I promoted you from brain damage to a simple fool because TD really cheated on you. So maybe you're still in shock, and I also promoted you there because I love you, fool. She looked at me sitting there with her mouth open and closed it, gently pressing upward on my jaw. Okay, I don't think I can stop here, she laughed. You're a fool for really thinking that I didn't want to have children with you. God, you're stupid. What do I tell you every time you come inside me? Do I need to? Okay, that's enough, I said. What is a DJP square? You said to name one, she smiled and took my hand. I think I'll name one of my kids after his father. So DJP square is Daniel James Payne Roman II. But if you think that's too formal or pompous, we could just call him Fool Junior. I leaned over and kissed her, starting the powerful Mustang engine. This beast was difficult to control at low speeds because the factory supercharger, as on all KRS, had been replaced with a much more powerful one. Danny, while you were telling us the story, I kept quiet, but you lied, she said. I saw your private investigator's reports hidden in your desk. You knew who these guys were before they died. I thought you'd go and try to hurt them and end up in jail. I couldn't let you ruin your life because of me, so I had to get Bobby off the streets before you got to him. Bobby's friend, Stu Morgenstern, was the one who supplied the substances they used on you. He supplied Bobby with a vial of GBL. Bobby gave it to TD, and when you met her for lunch, either she or he posed as a waiter, slipped it into your drink. I know this because my private investigator overheard Stu bragging about it while trying to sell the substance to another guy. We also learned the name of Duncan Holmes, Bobby's other friend, from this conversation. We didn't know that Bobby participated in the attack itself. We thought he only helped TD drug you. Duncan was the one who. 
I stopped to change the subject because I didn't want her to think about her attack. I kissed her, deeply and passionately. This is what I've usually been doing lately. Every time we mentioned her attack, I tried to replace the bad memory with a better one. In any case, I had nothing to do with their deaths. GBL is very powerful and toxic. In small doses, it is used as substance for sex. The difference between the amount used to make a person want to have sex with anything they see and an overdose that can cause coma or death is very small. There's even less of a difference between the amount that will cause a coma and the amount needed to kill someone within a few minutes. From what I understand, Stu had a party at his house. It was a really crappy place on the wrong side of town. He kept his GBL there. Anyway, he had a party with a few of his friends, and it turned out that one of the bottles of his favorite beer was the one he kept all his GBL in. You were at the sheriff's department here complaining about how poorly they were handling your case, she chuckled. How did you know? I asked, my face a mask of false surprise. I love you, fool, she said. DJP Square was born ten months later. End. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one. Listening to the next one.